Hey everybody, since we are either starting a new series or reading a standalone book, I am jumping in to remind you what the rules are for this podcast. First rule is no real people stories. That means that any details from our own lives are merely anecdotal, and we are not reading any books that depict real people as their characters in any way or are based on historical events. Second rule is that we are judging everything off of how the author treats characters and what they put them through. We are not judging the accuracy of the trauma, the accuracy of any actual conditions that may be portrayed, or the authenticity of a character's reaction to that trauma or that particular condition. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The hosts are not trained professionals, and their opinions come from personal experience, not professional training. In this episode, we discuss fictional depictions of trauma and violence that may not be suitable for all listeners, so please take care of yourselves. Specific content warnings for each episode can be found in the show notes. Events in the media are discussed in approximate order of escalation. This episode contains spoilers. This episode, we are discussing In Fury Born, the extended version of Path of the Fury by David Webb. In this book, Alicia DeVries works her way up through the military life she has always wanted, experiencing training, combat, and war, culminating in choices that will shape the rest of her life. Hi, I'm Nicole. And I'm Robin. And this is Books That Burn, where today we are discussing In Fury Born by David Weber. If you have read the book Path of the Fury also by David Weber. This book is a novel-length prequel for Path of the Fury, plus a heavily edited and extended version of Path of the Fury. So if you've only read Path of the Fury, read In Fury Born, you have twice as much book, and it's really great. Uh, You might be able to follow our discussion anyway. Oh, you definitely will. But also, just just so everybody knows, Path of the Fury is much more more uh relationship and like story based for lack of a better phrase for that in fury born is much more heavily military experience and specific combat based and tactical and strategy based so it is 30th 30th century military in space and on planets oh yeah absolutely it's a sci-fi book in the future but just as far as like as far as like emphasis is concerned if your favorite thing isn't tactics and strategy cool maybe just read path of the fury (laughs) well just be aware that in fury born starts out with a lot of that i definitely liked the path of the fury half better than the first half yeah anyway that digression aside uh, let's get into our factions. I guess not really a digression. It's an important thing. Getting into our factions, we have Alicia DeVries, also known as Allie. We have her family. We meet specifically her father and grandfather, but she also has a mom and some siblings. Then there is Tannis, who spends some time as Allie's wing. This is a term from the book. Then there is Charlie Company in the cadre. There's Uncle Arthur, who is the second in command, basically, to Emperor Seamus II of the human empire uh, across a bunch of planets. There's the Rish, which are definitely technically not lizard people. Oh, they're they're kind of like alien elephant slash dinosaur. <laughs> well, it's like they look like lizards, but they're not like lizards and part of they're not yeah yeah the book is like these are not lizards but people keep calling them the lizard people and they should stop but they won't because i'm writing this book and i wrote that they didn't (laughs) this yeah like this is these this is a slur that humanity uses against this this species but just so you know but just so you (laughs) and they don't like it but they also don't actually exist yeah. Right, but just so you know, I didn't write a race of lizard people. <laughs> I wrote a race that developed differently and happens to look like reptilians on Earth. Like, yeah, okay, uh, yeah, uh, and then various other military and intelligence officers, and so many, so many branches of the military. Uh, it's not so many branches. It's like three. It's less complicated than our military. It 
I don't read military sci-fi. It, you don't have to read sci-fi or fiction. I don't read military books. It was so many. It was so many. Okay, I, I just want to put in here, for people who do know anything about our military, there are three. There is the... the, the actually, no, I think there's just two. <laughs> there is the regular marine force that we hear a lot about, and then... Oh, you mean in the book, right? Yes. I'm not going to yeah, yeah, detail okay. the, I, I U.S. You were describing the U.S. System. military. No, that's not helpful okay. to our discussion. Right. <laughs> Anyways, um, there's the Marines that are the you know the the regular force, the military force in this scenario, and then there's the cadre who are the select elite, uh, better than our current equivalent of the Navy SEALs. Like they are literally augmented to be better than everybody else at what they do. Not like they're better than but like mm -hmm. you know more capable there we go yeah literally made to be more capable they start out with people who are mentally and physically more capable and then they modify them so much uh yeah so when robin is overwhelmed by the amount of military branches there are two <laughs> recon and raiders are specific assignments and specific like <laughs> I'm so glad you can keep track of this. <laughs> oh my god. Recon and Raiders are specific, are specific, like, duty tours, for lack of a better word. They're specific jobs. They're not even branches. They're just certain jobs that are, like, Recon goes in, gets the info, and then the Raiders come in and actually put in, like, the heavy firepower. And you can be assigned to one or two at, like, one at a time, but you can go on a tour as a recon or as a raider but you're still a marine that's it that's that's it that's all the structure that we're getting we're given in the book okay anyways moving I'm on i'm so glad you're the co-host because otherwise if it were up to it me would this so, podcast it would just be would so be many military branches <laughs> well my, this podcast would be nothing but uh paranormal romance urban fantasy books oh god i don't even think we've had any of those yet <laughs> We haven't had any of those yet. Well, gotta get on that, because uh, I don't know what we're looking this for. Is, this is why we are co-hosts with overlapping but distinct tastes. <laughs> anyway, uh, you can tell who wanted us to read this book. <laughs> I love this book very much. It's very good. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, uh, our, may, our minor character spotlight is... Uh, I wanted to talk about this because, for me, the dizzying array of characters where they get a bio that ranges from one paragraph to two pages, and then at the end of it, they get shot in the head and die. Almost invariably, they occasionally die in other ways. Sometimes it's lasers, sometimes it's a bullet, sometimes it's an explosion. They... There's, there are so many, and it's like, yeah, and he grew up on this planet and loves this thing and has, like, a partner or whatever, or, like, really, you know, his mind is really set on this battle and, like, looking and seeing how, like, their people are doing well, and then they die. And it's about 50-50, whether it's someone in the group we're rooting for or not. Uh, it might lean, like, 75 enemies, 25 uh, people we like, but still, it's it's very abrupt, and there are too many to name. There are almost too many to count. I did not go back through this 800-page book to count all of the minor characters <laughs> who are introduced and then killed off. <laughs> Did you have any thoughts? Because I know I suggested this topic. Yeah, so here's the funny thing about this topic. This wasn't traumatic to me. In fact, this was just, I thought, personally, and I thought this even when I was younger and read and and like read Path of the Fury for the first time when In Fury Born didn't even exist as a full thing. Uh it didn't register me as traumatic. In fact, I thought it was a great way without spending like a million pages giving complex background details to people. I thought it was a great way to kind of humanize the faceless fighters on both sides. I thought it was great. I thought I could it, it, and it's and it's done in a way where you very much as a reader, or at least I very much as a reader, didn't feel like Alicia was just and and Charlie Company and everybody was just slaughtering the bad guys. Like no, everybody is a person, aliens included. And it 
it, it sets that up really well, I thought, in a way where you totally could care about them, even if they were a second ago just a faceless horde that was out to kill the character that you've spent the whole book caring about. <laughs> but like, I thought, I thought it was a really good way to do it. And it made sense to me, and it made everybody feel like a person, and it made it more understandable why they were there. They weren't just there to be the bad guy in a book. Like, no, they had motives and decisions and opportunities and a goal, and it, it made them feel very real. And for Robin, it, it had almost the opposite effect. <laughs> yeah, so for me, it made... So, like, I started playing a game of, like, ooh, how soon are they gonna die? <laughs> oh, no. Uh, I was... No, because I like based on the first two sentences of their introduction, I'd be like, okay, the style of this person I've never heard of before that is outside, not safe in a building, and not safe uh, thousands of zone. miles away, uh, doing something remotely or on a comm station in space. Like, if you're not in space and you're not deep in a building talking to someone important in the hierarchy politically, then you're going to die. And I got so I was right pretty much every time about whether or not <laughs> they were going to survive. The first couple, I was like, oh, wait, but I thought this was a new person we were going to like end, and they're dead. And that happened a couple of times um, in a really particular battle in the early bit in, in the first part of the book. And then... On her on her recon tour. Yeah, on her recon tour. And uh, I'm helping. so glad you know when that is. And... Uh, she never actually got uh, to do... Well, no, I'm not gonna... It's yeah. not part of this. It's fine. Nope, it's not. It, it, just, it just made me feel like numb and like I couldn't get into caring about any of these minor characters because it's like, I should and, and they're dead. I mean, also, part of it is that I, both of us read very quickly. And so I am spending eight seconds getting to know these people because of how fast I read. <laughs> and that there's not time for this, like, deep emotional arc when I'm spending five to 15 seconds getting to know everybody. Um, I would argue, though, that the way it affected you, even if it was just 10 seconds, it's actually probably better no like that it it's a, that you didn't have time to form a deep emotional attachment because otherwise the trauma yeah, that like, for you would be worse like it's good writing but this is one that i wanted us to talk about yeah. because what it did to me as a reader was like i mean if you're trying to get the reader to in a um low trauma way get some of the feeling of like the numbing effect caused by all this war and death like as someone who where that is not part of my regular life at all like i went to my first funeral this summer like and i'm in my 20s like that's just not part of my life at all and anyway, and so having having something that created this like this build up and this numbing effect in a way that isn't actually inflicting a trauma on me, I think is really good writing. It just meant that I was like, we can't pick any of these minor characters individually because it's just a parade of them. So Moving on to the Charlie Company massacre. This was, this is, this is like, this is the biggest battle with the most description, at least in the prequel section. I think in the whole book. Yes. Goes on for a long time. Uh, I mean, it's because, a very lengthy. Yeah, it's a very lengthy section. And it is, um, they did a drop onto a planet for a rescue operation. They were trying to rescue, I think, 600 people and get them out of what was supposed to be a lightly held um, group of terrorist thing where it would be maybe 250 uh, hostiles total. So it ended up being two thousand they lost 96 percent of their people not trying to recap the tr plot right. just trying to frame I, they they lost 96 percent <clears throat> of them and saved 97 percent of the civilians so i just want to give a couple of framing pieces for this 
They and we'll talk about this a little bit too. They so there's a couple of 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 pieces here that really really kind of impact how big of a a, a magnitude this was. This was in this is while Alicia was in the cadre, and they are the elite. They are the best of the best. They are the the best because they skim the surface of the best of the people in the military and pull them in for this assignment. And then, kind of like we stated already, they also use technology to augment them further to make them better fighters, better soldiers. So the cadre takes losses. That happens on most assignments anyway. But this was one where it was supposed to be, it was it was more difficult, more um, more risky of a mission. So they weren't going to send a different branch. It was just, it was just difficult enough that they sent the cadre, but it was supposed to be easy for them. Right. They also, they also had things like there's two configurations that the cadre can go under. There's heavy and light configuration. Heavy configuration is heavy firepower. Light configuration is, is light firepower and weapons that will wound or knock out or incapacitate instead of kill. And, and uh, they were trying to. Ability. And higher flex, yeah, and higher flexibility. They they went on under light configuration because they were trying not to kill the civilians, and then they got shot out of the sky. <laughs> yeah, uh, like they they literally were configured to go in almost under almost stealth, and the enemy knew where they were from the beginning. Like the the trauma for them, the trauma for the survivors, the trauma for the people who made it to the ground started with this this thing where they should have been relative like not safe they are going in literally into a a hostile situation they're not safe but relatively speaking this was a safe mission and when we say the drop we mean the drop like from a, a vehicle think of a in parachute the upper drop in the upper atmosphere yeah, yeah they think, have think, par- think parachute drop except future tech where you don't actually have a shoot <laughs> essentially oh, shoot but it's not a parachute um, right it, right but visually like that's what's happening so they're literally dropping from the sky and and they should have if their intelligence had been correct they should have just landed on the ground and then had to go find the enemy and then slowly made their way in and instead the trauma for the people who even made it to the ground which by the way was less than 70 it was like 63 it was 63 i just did the math they lost 77 percent of their people just getting to the ground yeah so like the the trauma for the survivors started right away because this was supposed to be a relatively safe mission and then they just lost everybody almost immediately and because of future tech they have um they could see the dots for everybody in the company Mm -hmm. um yeah so they know as everybody dies as it happens yeah they didn't like get to the ground and then find out there were few of them they and oh there's this um like this is a, a slightly edging on a plot thing but it's just like such um emblematic of like the confusion and um just stress and and everything caused by that um the computer is trying to keep track of who is in charge in the chain of command and as people are getting wiped out of the sky the icon keeps like switching from person to person to person then as soon sometimes before it can settle on the next person in the chain of command that person gets killed and Alicia was in charge of a squad and ends up leading what is left of a company. Yeah. Because everybody above her, all of the NCOs died. And and it's and the, the interesting part with this book and with this character, the trauma that we're talking about is not actually the fighting. We're specifically talking about the trauma of losing these people that she like eats, breathes, sleeps, fights hangs out like even more i would almost i would argue than like our like realistic military situations in the in in our current real world these are the only people that she does anything with and it's designed that way it's designed so that you're not just serving with them for however long you're not just 
in the same place as them. You're not just training with them. These, the people in the cadre are supposed to, and especially your own wing, your own buddy, your partner, and your squad, uh, you're supposed to know those people so well that you can almost just know what they would do in any given tactical situation with almost without having to ask, especially as wing, as wings. And they're, they're, that's highlighted in a, an interesting way that actually kind of more highlights the trauma also. Alicia and her wing are the only pair, it's, they're the only wing pair who make it, who survive. Everybody else loses their buddy. And there are multiple points in the, in, in the, in the raid where, in the infiltration, where we, we get these snapshots of people who have lost their wings being paired together as temporary wings. And I say temporary because all the ones we know about die. Yeah. So like, yeah, there's that. See our see our minor character spotlight for more information on that. <laughs> right. But you but there's very much this th- I think the author actually does a really good job of setting it up as these are not the people who have been paired together for years. They don't know each other that well, but they still because of how closely they live and train and work and breathe and function together. They still trust each other and are okay to be each other's wing. This there's no getting to know you. And and that is almost that and and that really I think highlights how bad it is to lose all of these people because these 600 people were our main character's world. 275 600 was the hostage. Number. Oh, I'm sorry. He's less than 300 people. But it's, it's, it, it's like, for her, it's like losing extensions of herself, especially as a squadron leader. Yeah. And so, because- like, specifically for everybody in her squad, and then generally for everybody in the company. And, like, the cadre, like, in these books, like, you don't leave. You no. can, you can be deactivated, but you can't retire. You can never actually be done. Um, that's important for plot shenanigans, but as yes. it relates to this trauma, it's not like she's gonna do some tours and have this like super deep bond and then leave them. There, there, there's not just des- no, they're buddies for life. <laughs> there's not by design. There isn't supposed to be a and then I'll right. leave you. Um, plot things means she has that anyway, but it it's it's not meant to be something that you leave and to lose everybody like that it just like they're they're it is handled so well but like they're i just i don't have words for something that big and that terrible and yeah like the the one thing i would say with this is like it is so big it is such with how it's treated in the story and like how we're going through it and everything with all the characters and the play by play and all this attention to it, like attention in terms of like where the book has its attention, not like drama. It, um, it, there are other bigger massacres elsewhere in the book, but this is the one where she loses her people. And this is the one that is the most described. Just as a, a thing to mention, because we we really, really hope that uh, none of our listeners have been through something like this. But if you're thinking of reading this book, I would like to mention another massacre that she goes through, which is her entire family being killed. In most books, that would be the biggest trauma in the book. In this, it's not. And this one, it doesn't even rank, I think, top three. It doesn't even make top three. I'm mentioning it because hopefully it is the biggest trauma possible that anyone listening to this might have been through. And if you're thinking of reading the book, we wanted to give you that content warning because hopefully you have not been in a 96% casualty situation. And if you are, uh, that that really sucks. I have no idea whether or not this is a book you'll like. I, I will, on that note, as as kind of stated in our minor character section, this is not Robin's experiences in any way, shape, or form. No, like, it's, it's not. I'd- I enjoy this book because despite having not actually served in the military myself, it's super relatable. Yeah. I, full disclosure... Kind of trying to keep it to our no real people stories, but also I, I actually looked at serving in the military because the military felt relatable. Yeah. So it, it is felt entirely like a place you'd want to be. It felt it felt like it would be 
just more of the same felt familiar and if if you have gone through some things i don't actually know if this would be cathartic or just more <laughs> yeah um, we but for me for me this book is 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 very good it's a good way to kind of work through things without it happening to me again so we're not we're not saying if you've gone through something like this this book is inherently not a good one i'm saying it's just saying that your mileage may vary and if it sounds like something that you would enjoy this book is full of it our last topic is betrayal and broken bonds of loyalty for Allie. Yeah. So this is this one is building off of our topic 2. So just in case somebody skipped that one because of the inherent content. Uh just a small recap without really talking about it. Our topic 2 is about a particular massacre of Allie's Alicia's uh, combat company. Everybody she fights with, almost. So the betrayal here is that they were set up. Yeah. That's all I'm saying about topic two, because if you skipped it for reasons, I understand. <laughs> but mm-hmm. uh, these two are inherently linked and there's no real way to like separate them. And so you kind of have to know what we're referencing. Yep. Uh, so, um, yeah. So here's the thing. This is an ongoing... There, there's, there's several moments where she finds out or figures out different pieces of this betrayal and different parts of its magnitude but (sighs) it's a building ongoing over time trauma she starts out thinking it's bad and then keeps finding out that it's worse yeah and And this is the one thing like again you know 30th century drugs and coping and everything but this is the thing where she has ptsd like symptoms I only say PTSD-like because we are not diagnosing a fictional character. Um, but where she has... Um, like any... Where she has anything to process later that she we see her process on screen. Yeah. And, I mean, for her, you know, she feels like this betrayal is still happening, which I hesitate from describing as PTSD, PTSD because it is literally still happening. Yeah. So, uh... I don't know if it qu- falls quite in that same category. We don't have like 20 years on she still thinks everyone's lying to her. Like we don't No, have, we don't we don't get any of that. We don't have something like that to make it be like okay. Well, this here's is that. Here's the thing that I see what made as you her categor- say this was PTSD. My the reason I'm categorizing it as that is because even the people that she does trust, that she explicitly trusts and does not believe is part of the betrayal and part of the conspiracy and part of any of this, she doesn't confide in. Mm-hmm. Because what if she's wrong? And what if they're the problem? And what if they betray her? Yeah. And the thing is, she explicitly talks in the book about how she knows it isn't them. But it doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter because it's still happening to her and she can't pull back and she can't get ally and like the only the only even ally that she ends up enlisting she doesn't enlist he basically says hey i'm helping you now and then there's this whole thing where he has to convince her to let him be a resource for her yeah and he and and he drops in saving her life and that's honestly probably the only reason that she even included him because he could have let her die and if he was part of the conspiracy he would have yeah but like that, there's some things there where where we watch her say, "This is still happening. I can't," even though it's explicitly not in that moment, and she even knows that it's not. She says that it's not, and she still reacts as though it is. And like she refuses to speak to anyone from intelligence because just point blank, yeah, straight just, up, I will not speak if they are <sighs> in the room. I'm not saying anything else. Yeah, and and also part of this the this broken bond of of trust it's not just the betrayal of the company being set up it's not just it's not just the betrayal of of her company dying and of of the person going unpunished it's also the fact that in the cadre their loyalty is to the emperor direct they don't they're above every other military branch and personnel their their rank equivalents are two ranks higher so a sergeant in the cadre is two ranks higher equivalent than a sergeant anywhere else. Like, they are explicitly the emperor's weapon, and they are the most heavily 
armored. They're the most heavily trained. They're the most uh, heavily augmented. They're, they're, they have the most money spent on them. They have the most time, resources. The only thing they don't have uh, is that they are not, uh, they're not the biggest unit because <laughs> their, their selection criteria is so, so specified and, and so, um, uh, so specified and so strict. Mm-hmm. But in so this selective. case, so selective, yes, <laughs> that would be the word. <laughs> so, in, in this case, this betrayal is is not just that somebody in the company did or in the in the military or in the political um, structure betrayed them, but it's that when she finds out who it is, the emperor himself says, we are not persecuting this person because of these reasons. Prosecuting. We're not prosecuting, prosecuting this person. Yeah, that one. So there, there's just this very... It, it's... It sets up the st- it the the betrayal the betrayal is that the person that she quite quite literally has pledged her life to said that the lives of everyone in your company and everyone who died for essentially no reason they were set up there was no like that was it that was the whole point yeah uh keeping this person alive for these reasons is worth more to me than everything that happened and he tried to the do betrayal. the like I definitely value all of Charlie Company, but also this comes first. And at the end of the book, like it, it's but it's bad enough that at the end of the book he apologizes to her and is like, "You're right. I I I said that I was honoring Charlie Company, and I did not. And it's just just with how this is handled, I I'm so glad." that for a betrayal and revenge story you have the people involved for make involved in making it worse apologize for their part in making it worse because a lot of revenge narratives will just have like everybody bad getting killed and they're like like ha- having the people who should have done something admit that they should have done something different I just, I think it, it really makes it a much better story and so well handled, which I know we'll we'll get to in, in the wrap up, but I really like that for this depiction of this betrayal, it does come full circle. Yeah. Uh, speaking of it being that her PTSD, if she has it, seems to be more from the betrayal. I thought I had something. I don't think I had something. Uh, I think. Oh, I wanted to say that she has tech that makes her body react while she's in a war zone. Well, as far as I can... In general, it makes her body react in general to threats. Just just in general. Yeah, yeah. Like, you know, people, anyone doing a medical procedure on her needs specific things so that her, the tech in her body mm-hmm. won't <laughs> kill her because it thinks she's been captured. Like, that, like, yeah. Um, and as best as I can tell... They have drugs that make her mind not get PTSD. Like, because otherwise, there's no way that anybody could... I think that is... I think that's actually hand-waved a little bit in the book, because I think, from at least the way I read it, was that it's not that the drugs don't stop them from getting PTSD. Because it's it's definitely not like, oh, Kadrim, and get counseling. No, but I but I think I think the implication, especially with the way it's talked about, is that their selection criteria for who makes it into the cadre is so like I think that's one of the things that they try and gear toward, and the implication is that in the future we have the ability to tell who will be tra- like they they pick people who enjoy the combat and don't take damage mentally from it. They pick people who can who, for a, lack of a better word, can just handle that without needing to heal from it, and. I think that's the impl that was the implication that I got was that they're just so selective that you don't get PTSD from the things that you do. Which I think Mm -hmm. honestly is part of why It's definitely a hand wave, but it it is definitely a hand wave, but I think it's also why we see Allie have more things that look like PTSD from that betrayal because the combat part she's cool with. Right. The but things she that she has to do are fine. The training is things that she enjoys. She has fun 
It's enjoyable. She wasn't selected for the cadre based on her ability to have her confidence in everything that she's built her life around shattered. No. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, like that's like, she wasn't, she didn't, she didn't sign up to be betrayed. She did sign up to fight. She wasn't selected for her ability to resistance to, to human wounds, <laughs> like emotional wounds. She was selected for her ability to be okay with the combat. I, I think that's what it is. I, I don't think it's that her. Now, that being said, uh, it is much harder to, or I'm sorry, much easier to take less damage from from something if you are augmented so that you get instant healing and you get instant pain drugs and you're not taking physical effects from things in the moment because your pharmascope is, is handling it for you. Like that is definitely a thing that probably contributes to this also. But yeah, I don't, I don't think it's that they have magic anti PTSD drugs. I think it's that mm-hmm. they're just set up and intentionally set up to give them the best shot possible, including just with who they choose. That makes sense. But also I would like to point out that unless the story is about PTSD, because it's not most, most sci-fi combat books don't have their characters show that off. Um, that's just kind of a a thing. Huh. Yeah, you're more familiar with uh, war sci-fi. Again, yeah, not, like they... <laughs> my, not my preferred genre. <laughs> yeah, they, that's that's just like a general, like they don't, they don't have people who just are fighting it or whatever. Like they don't, they don't have people who have that in general. And, and I don't actually know if that's just a, an easy plot device that authors just kind of are like, oh, I don't want to write that in. Or if generally speaking, they, it's like, well, it's the future. We've solved that problem. Like, I don't actually know what the logic is there. I just know that it's pretty consistent. Or if they're just not thinking of it. That's true. Because that's, that's not true. why they wrote the book. That's not the book they wanted to write. And, and also, there are a couple of authors who sidestep that particular thing. But as a general rule, you don't see it discussed or talked about or really demonstrated very well. Moving on to the wrap up and ratings, we have our gratuity rating for the parade of minor characters. Uh, it is, it ranges from moderate to severe. They're brief. They're very brief. But They're very brief, but they are all graphic. I would go, I'm just going to go ahead and say severe, because if this isn't something that's going to affect you negatively, then you're probably fine. But if it is going to, then it it sounds like from what Robin said that it's going to be pretty bad. Yeah, it's, it is numbing and feels relentless. So, uh, again, head to the section if you want to hear more about that. If you don't, then, um, yeah. There's... We get it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and for Charlie Company, it's um, severe. It's definitely severe. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the betrayal, I think it's moderate in terms of description and how it's depicted in the book. It's like the event is huge, but... It's clearly... I mean, it's severe to the characters. It's, oh, but it's totally severe audience, to the character. Yeah. Like, unless something... If you have been betrayed by your organization, this might be severe for you. If you haven't, and you're just reading this book... That's what I'm wrestling with, because I don't think this is just betrayed by your organization. I think you could make an argument where this could impact someone who has experienced a pretty significant emotional betrayal in general. Like personally. Yeah. Like, yeah. It, it, relationally, or just... Uh, or even, even for that matter, even someone who, who has experienced just parental betrayal over and over like this this could kick it up to severe from authority figures yeah yeah um or even just trusted people like it doesn't necessarily have to even be an authority figure it could just be somebody that you didn't think would do that i'm gonna gonna go ahead and go with severe (laughs) okay all right i was gonna say unfortunate harmonic resonances resonances in your own life might kick this up but but how but remember, this isn't just how it's going to hit people. It's how it's described in the text. It's described in the text as being incredible. Like, I-, I think it really is, is the thing. Okay. All right. Yeah, this is one of our more uh, nebulous traumas. Well, because so. well, this is the thing, is where this is not something that hits either of us. Yeah. But reading it, it is no less graphic. That's true. Does that okay, make sense? Okay, good point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What it is changes the nature of how graphic feels. 
Right. Exactly. Okay. All right. So severe all around then. I just think this is one of those where if it's not something that has hurt you before, you're probably fine. But that's also been true of a lot of the books that we've gone over already. Yeah. So I would argue this one is severe if it's something you've experienced. Okay. And then even if you haven't, the description even if you is haven't, very it's still specific. Pretty, yes. <laughs> uh, is the trauma integral to the plot for the minor characters? I think... I think it I think it is because otherwise okay, you just Here's my argument it is literally interchangeable. Okay. That's fine. I don't think it's irrelevant. I think it needed to be there. Something needed to be there. They they this was going to happen to them. Did we <laughs> see it or not? Yeah. Uh so it is by definition interchangeable. Again, for more detail, listen to the specific section cuz that's how this works. Uh but yeah, literally interchangeable. To an astonishing degree. Uh, okay. Then for Charlie Company, it is integral to the plot. Yep. Uh, Absolutely. Oh, The betrayal wait, is wait. also good. I, I have a hard counter, actually. Oh, no. I, oh, okay. No. okay, okay, okay. Here's my hard counter. Uh, okay. On the ability for it to be interchangeable. And my argument for that is that an entire book existed without having this described an entire fully formed published book because this event happens in the prequel that my my double counter to that Uh uh-huh is that the event still happened Mm -hmm. even if it wasn't detailed originally Mm -hmm. and that it did have to have happened okay so your argument is that it was backstory my argument is that even if it was backstory it is the plot okay all right. And and actually, I'll... same one for our third topic. I think it's the same thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, okay. I, I will accept that counter and say that both Charlie Company and The Betrayal are integral to the plot. Okay. All and right, I literally we'll... only think that because reading, when I when I read the original, mm-hmm. like I knew I didn't have all of why. Okay. I knew I hadn't been giving that information yet. You felt like there you needed more Oh, yeah. I was excited when I heard prequel. I was like, yes, we'll get to find out. (laughs) Um, Okay. (laughs) Like, there was definitely something. Yeah, I just read this whole thing and so never had that uh, emotional journey. Yeah. I just had the book. Uh, For Treated with Care, for the minor character parade. uh, (laughs) Is the answer just no? Yeah, the answer is no. Uh, So... I care because we're talking about it. I say attention because we're oh, talking yeah. about it at all. Uh, but not, it's not care. It's just not, just not at all. Uh, care would have been not talking about it for this particular one. <laughs> yeah. This is not to knock the book. It's great. I understand why it's in here. It makes sense. It's beautifully done. But it's very well, very well done. But by definition, was not treated with care. Uh, I would I think the same. Oh, for Charlie Company? I think the same for all three. All of it? Yeah. I don't think any of it was treated with care, but I also think that that, I don't, I don't want to say is by design, but I I, th- I think that it would not have been the same book if it was, and I think that there, there is, this is a war book and at a certain point at a certain point, if you treat it with care, it's no longer that book, and you're almost making light of what is happening. Yeah, and so I think it, yeah, doing so a th- disservice to anyone who was trying to get this narrative. Yeah, because hand waving war events in a war book. Right. Right. Yeah. So I think I think none of it was treated with care, but I don't think there was a way to tell this story, treat it with care, and also not feel like you're just dismissing it. Yeah. I don't think that it would have been possible. So, not treated with care, proceed with caution, but also it's a very good book. And again, this this is this is one of well, not again if you went straight to this wrap up. This is <laughs> yeah. one of those things where either you need a giant trigger warning for descriptions of combat and violence that steadily escalate throughout the entire thing or this doesn't resonate with a thing in your life and you're totally fine and and you can just like proceed past the trigger warning and you're good 
it's probably going to be pretty all or nothing. If you try, you can't get through. If you know, if you've got to stop at chapter eight, it's not going to get better. Just stop. <laughs> and and also and also with regards to that, if because I kind of stated this in our topic first topic, but again, in case you skip past that, if you like the story and can handle some of that, but not in the detail that the book starts out with, may I recommend picking up in Fury Born? Or I'm sorry, in Path yeah. of the Fury. Path of the Fury. Uh, Path of the Fury is the original release that is only the second half and does not have as much for sure. And specifically not all of the physical death descriptions in anywhere near intensity or frequency of the prequel. So, you know, if you want the story and you want to know what happened, you could almost even, I would argue, uh, look up like a summary of the prequel and then just read Path of the Fury. I think you could totally do that and still enjoy this book. Yeah, I I a second that. I haven't read Path of the Fury, but you know the book's very neatly well, divided. You kind of so. have. <laughs> yeah, I've kind technically, of technically technically yeah. you have. Point of view: trauma and aftermath for the minor character um, parade. It is the minor character's perspective for the trauma, and somebody else's perspective for the aftermath mm-hmm. every single time. <laughs> Uh, if you didn't listen to the main thing, have fun guessing why. Uh, yeah, so... (laughs) Robin. (laughs) Anyway, yeah, so with the point of view, the whole point of this thing is that we are getting the point of view of all these minor characters. Yeah. Uh, for Charlie Company, we have a bunch of individual people in Charlie Company Plus, like, we, we have the perspective of the people inflicting this trauma and mm-hmm. the perspective of the people going through it and the perspective of the people who meant to inflict it and accidentally ended up going through it <laughs> somewhat. Uh, yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Like, that's, that's part of uh, tur- turnabout's fair play. Uh, end up with some of that. Um, betrayal. We mostly just get a, well, we get other people trying to understand her perspective. We also get the people who are doing it. That's true. We do get the perspective of the betrayers pretty consistently. Um, oh, yeah, like a which, lot. <laughs> yeah, which is like really interesting, but it doesn't do it in a way that's like these people are actually fine. It's like no, like no, they're get, not. <laughs> you get you get the reason they're doing what they're doing, but the book. It doesn't give weight to their justifications. No, not at all. Which is a very delicate line to tread. And I think that this was done very well for that. Showing what they think without saying that it thinks they're right. Which is tricky. Now it's the aspiring writer tip? Yes. (laughs) Okay, good. That's good. Do you have one? Because if not, I do. Okay, you do yours. I actually think... That I just want to highlight, I guess again, but I want to highlight that this book humanizes characters very, very well. And 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 I, I just want to, I guess the aspiring writer tip is that there is more than one way to do that. And you don't necessarily have to do it with pages and pages and pages and pages and pages and pages of backstory. Like you don't, like you can do it in an instant and you can do it in a moment and you can do it in a half a page. And that ended up being... One of the the traumatizing things we're talking about, but that's because this is a book about combat and war. And so, you know, that that factors in, but it, it's done very well. And it's done in a way that you care when those characters are gone. Especially when it's going to be a longer book with a high body count. Don't be afraid to have us meet people, even if... You're only touching on them in the story for whatever reason. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the thing is too with, with this is that I'm, I'm not necessarily saying like this is the way to go, but having, having, having character, it's so, it's so easy and it's, it's so, I guess, kind of normal in, in combatants and sci fi both to have, there's a lot of authors I've read who flip flop <laughs> between either That one minor character that gets mentioned every five pages because you know they're going to die eventually and Mm -hmm. they're just kind of there all the time and then eventually it happens and you're like, yep, because I only hear about you as 
your plot progression happens and you're not actually helpful in the story. Like yeah. those there's authors who flip between that and faceless hordes being slaughtered by the main character. Yeah. And, and this-, this book doesn't do either of those things. It's got really good pacing. There's nobody that feels extra. That's true. And you care when people die and you care even when they're the enemy. You build empathy for characters that you will never see again and never saw before. And that's really hard to do. Yeah. That's hard it to does do it anyway. really well. So I just, I think my aspiring writer tip is that you don't have to get locked into pages of backstory or just writing them off. Like, there's other things to do, and not necessarily that you need to do what this character did, but that, you know, explore your options, come up with something, find out, you know, test out different things, because you can totally do any, all of this. Yeah. Believe in yourself. That's my aspiring writer tip. <laughs> okay. I uh, guess. <laughs> favorite non-traumatic thing about the book? This book has non-traumatic things? Uh, no, I'm just kidding. That's what I was going to say. I don't know <laughs> what there is non-traumatic things okay we gotta think a minute i've got mine okay what's yours mine is non-traumatic for me okay cool i'm gonna i'm gonna put a disclaimer that that doesn't mean it's non-traumatic for anybody else Mm -hmm. i really like and resonate with how much she likes the combat and the training itself yeah the fact that she enjoys it is super relatable and i really enjoy that I was boot camp. It was fun. Do you know that I have, if I had the money, there are, there are places you can go where you basically go through boot camp, but it's not militarily attached. Play roller derby. If I had the money, if I had the money, no, roller derby's too tame for me. If I had the <laughs> money, I would do those things for fun. <laughs> not making light of the military experience, but like. There I mean, are parts of it that are not related to killing that you think you would like to do. Oh, I 100% would yeah. in a heartbeat. Like, well, even even with the the combat itself and and like and killing itself, like I did for real almost sign up with both yeah. the army and the marines. Like, <laughs> I I looked at that and went, that does look like fun. Yes, I do want to be a navy seal. Thank you. And then I I decided not to for other reasons, but yeah, I I like that she enjoys it and it's not something that's just happening to her and it's it's not rare in sci-fi books to get that, but it is a little bit rare to get it without the the horrors of war backstory side experience and just seeing her having fun. I I am happy with. Yeah, mm, I uh, I have no idea. Um, my reaction is a little bit like there are non-traumatic things. Yeah. Um, my you totally are. <laughs> well, there are, but. Uh, they're plot spoilers. Oh, that's true. Like, major plot spoilers. Uh, okay, my favorite non-traumatic thing in this book is the AI. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Yeah, yep. she's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The AI, the AI is fun. So, um, yeah. That's nice and generic. I like yep, it. Yep, the AI is great. Read the book. The AI is awesome. The uh, AI is a reason to read Path of the Fury anyway yeah Yeah. (laughs) all right i think that's it and we will see you well hopefully you will listen to us in a fortnight uh all right thanks for listening All music used in this podcast was created by me as Heartbeat Art Co. and is used with permission. You can follow us on Twitter at Books That Burn, all one word. Email us with questions, comments, or book re- recommendations at Books That Burn at Yahoo.com. Support us on Patreon.com slash Books That Burn. All patrons get access to our upcoming book list and receive a one-time shout out. Leave us an iTunes review. This really helps people to find the show. And find us on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll be back in two weeks.